that mean a second nature to you. That means nobody has to prompt you or push you, but automatically you give God some praise. Praise is what I do. That means that when all else has failed and I've lost everything, all I got left is my praise. So if God has been good to you, give him some praise like you never ever given him before think about when you were down and out no one to turn to but God somehow some way work that thing out for your good well time is of the essence I've come today to pay homage and celebrate with my pastor, our pastor, my father in the faith. First give honor to God for just creating what he's created with me. I give the pastor, our pastor, Dr. Melvin Mariner, the utmost respect, congratulations and gratitude for allowing me to stand in front of this sacred guest again give honor to his wife and everyone that's here under the sound of my voice I, my wife sends her congrats Dr. Mariner but she's preaching at New Genesis today thank God to have a wife that's a preacher and I can ask her to stand in my stead but I want to thank Grove for supporting me in my first book project The Soul of Manhood I'm happy to announce that Dr. Mariner just confirmed with me that he would do the forward to my personal project. It's coming in 2016. The name of it is Even Stumbling Steps Are Ordered. It's time for me to tell the story. I'm honored because nine years ago this month, I stood here and shook our pastor's hand as he handed me my license to preach the gospel. All I can say is, wow, it's been an honor to celebrate with him today. Some of you all know I would be here from seven all the way to after one. Hadn't done that in a while. I didn't preach at New Genesis none in the last month. Preached last week, but I could not let this day go by and not spend it here with our pastor. But all of that is in order, and I'm going to get right to the word of God. If you have your Bibles. I done cried all day. People were looking for me. I had to keep my composure. I don't like to cry in front of people, so if I cry, don't talk about me. Uh, man, that just means I've been thinking back to when I met this man. You know, when nobody wants to deal with you, but somebody's willing to walk with you through your troubles. If you have your Bibles, turn to the prophetic book of Nehemiah. I know I'm at Grove and I'm not at New Genesis, so I won't be before you long. Something about the Old Testament, it forces you to teach before you preach. Uh, I have New Genesis and God has New Genesis, has us on a journey. But God gave me this text today to uplift him at the same time and celebrate our pastor. I know he's coming to New Genesis in November as I celebrate my second pastoral anniversary. But you all don't know how it feels to serenade him through sermon and think about his life and his accomplishments. Nehemiah, the sixth chapter, starting at the first verse, and we're going to go up to verse nine. I'm so thankful for this man of God that sent me to school, had my back through it, has had my back through it all. I'm just overwhelmed right now. Usually when I come home to preach, he's not here. So for him to be in the presence, to see what God has done in nine years, means the world to me. I'll be reading from the New Revised Standard of God's Word. The Bible says, starting at verse 1 in the 6th chapter of Nehemiah, Now when it was reported to Sambalak and Tabia and Geshem, 
the Arab and the rest of our enemies that I had built the walls and there was no gap left in it. Though up to that time I had not set up the doors and the gates. Sambalet and Geshem sent to me saying, come and let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they intended to do harm. So I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it to come down to you? They sent to me four times in this way, and I answered them in the same manner. In the same way, Sambalat for the fifth time sent his servant to me with an open letter in his hand. And in it was written, it is reported among the nations in Geshem. Also says that you and the Jews in tune to rebel, that is why you are building the wall. And according to this report, you wish to become their king. You have also set up prophets to proclaim Jerusalem concerning you. There is a king in Judah, and now it will be reported to the king according to these words. So come therefore and let us confer together. Then I sent to him saying, no such thing as you say has been done. You are inventing them out of your own mind, for they all wanted to frighten us, thinking their hands will drop from the work and it will not be done. But now, O oh God, strengthen my pastor's hands. But now, O oh God, strengthen my pastor's hands. One I'm going to lift up today where it says in verse 3, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, I thank you for all that you've done today. I thank you for sending my few friends that I have, two of them, Pastor Wolf Wolford and Pastor Cedric Rousen, for preaching a word for my father in the faith and bless my home church, this house. But I ask right now that you use me in like manner, God, to bless your manservant as well as this congregation. God, speak to me and through me. I cannot preach until you preach to me. Bless your word and bless your people. In Jesus' name, let those that love the Lord say amen. amen. Hey, Uncle Robert Barnes. If I could just tag such a text today. For this moment, honoring our pastor for 32 years of preaching, it would be stay up and don't come down. Stay up and don't come down. It was in 1962 that there was an only child born to a military man named James Mariner. That child was born unto a woman by the name of Magdalene Mariner that worked in the school system. As a little boy, he lived in a small section of a town with a dusty roads called Bowers Hill. This was a community that was evolving with time, being considered a little rural area. His parents made sure he went to church. If I can remember the story correctly, in his youth, he sung in the choir and was a youth usher. His parents instilled in him to have faith in God. But on this Sunday back in 1983, God called this man out of a place where he was living righteously, trying to figure out this thing called life. Many of those that witnessed the confirmation had no clue that God would elevate him to such a place in ministry. Church, I've heard the stories over the years of how people would say things such as he was not college material. That's not to say that nobody believed in him, but while some counted him out, I can stand here and boldly say that God counted on him. This place in which God was elevating this man calls him to sacrifice his young adulthood and follow God. Being young called to preach is not easy. 
I say this not from what I've heard, but from experience. Adjusting to the call of ministry takes some major changes in your life. Those that have hung out with you and know your dark side have a hard time seeing you operate in ministry. To answer a call to ministry means you are willing to put self aside and let God have his way in your life. Usually that to accept the call, accept the call in the blind, still questioning why God called you, questioning whether God really called you. When accepting the call of ministry, people around you can be very judgmental. I summons everybody under the sound of my voice to think back to when you first started walking with the Lord. As Betty Wright was saying her day, some of us have to think back a little further than others. But do you remember how people watched your every move? People would say he or she's supposed to be a Christian. To be a believer requires you to be a lover of people. It requires you to be selfless and you have to be able to take some stuff. You have to care about people even if they don't care about you. After all the ostracizing and the backbiting, look at your life now. God and has and is calling all of us out of the bondage of the world into his wonderful grace. Many of us need the motivation and the coaching to help and assist us in getting to the place where God desires us to be. The place in which God desires us to be is higher than where we used to be. Is there anybody here that can look back over his or her life and say God has brought you a mighty long way? All right, you don't have to talk back to me, but I met an older preacher about 15 years ago. He told me, Melvin, you cannot rise to low expectations. Uh, then he went on to say to change your life, you have to change your playground, your playmates, and your playthings. Bear with me as I navigate my way to the text, but I've messed around and looked back in my life. I look back at the ruins and the rubbles, the cracks and the crevices that God has pulled me out of. Is there anybody else here that doesn't mind looking back to the ruins, the rubbles and the cracks and the crevices that God pulled you out of? You can sit there and act like you've always had it together. But there are some of us here that God pulled out of some strange places. He pulled us out of some places that mama couldn't get us out of. Daddy couldn't get us out of, but it took a God to pull us out and put us where we are now. Well, church, there are times in our lives when we have been so faithful and diligent in working for the Lord that God elevates us however the enemy tries to bring us down. But when such times occur, stay up and whatever you do, don't come down. Here in this prophetic book of Nehemiah, God is on the brink of bringing the Israelites out of a long Babylonian captivity. God called a man by the name of Dr. Mariner, I mean Nehemiah, to a place of leadership. This cupbearer, which means humble servant, was given the responsibility of rebuilding the wall that surrounded the holy city of Jerusalem. The wall was in ruins because the besiegements and attacks Jerusalem had suffered over 70 years prior. And when the Assyrians attacked them from the north, later the barbaric Babylonians attacked them from the south. Nehemiah was tasked to do a job in which many felt was impossible. Not only did they believe that this was impossible, there were many that did not want to see the wall rebuilt. They did not want to see this wall that had been torn down, restored. That wall is like the lives of many of us. The world has torn us apart and tore us down to such a place that only God was able to build us back up. Back during the biblical times, this wall represented great strength and great protection. In those ancient times, the only physical structure of protection was a wall. This wall that Daniel describes of being 380 feet thick and about 100 feet high. 
So this task given to Nehemiah was not a small one. As Nehemiah set out to rebuild the wall, he surveyed the ruins. Sometimes we have to look back over our lives and see the ruined areas and assess the damage. After Nehemiah assessed the damage, he contacted everyone he needed to aid him in rebuilding this wall. During the reconstruction, some enemies of Israel got word that the wall of Jerusalem was being rebuilt. They were not too fond of seeing an oppressed people walk in liberation back in the very place where they were first taken into captivity. The rebuilding of the wall was a project that God promised his people. There were some that believed God was going to do just what he said he would do. Whenever God uses us to do his work, we have to expect the enemy to come and try to shut us down. Being a member of this church, I've seen, being a member of this church, I said I've seen some things. I've seen some things come that tried to shut us down, but God, but God always kept us so that we were able to move forward. In the text, the Bible tells us that Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, and the other enemies had a problem with the wall being rebuilt. The text is telling us that there are people that have a problem with what God is doing in our lives. But we have to come far and turn back now. We have come too far to turn back now. Nehemiah said they called for him to come off the wall and meet with him in a village called Ono. Ono was a place located approximately 30 miles outside of the walls of Jerusalem. It was a place where Nehemiah would have been at a disadvantage. They would have attacked him and possibly killed him. They were trying to get him off the wall so they could level the playing field. All of us have been to a place called Oh No in our lives. Better yet, all of us have been through Oh No before. In order to get to Jerusalem, in order to get to your blessing, you have to go through a place called Oh No. See, God dwells in Jerusalem. But to get to God, you have to go through, oh no. Nehemiah had already went through, oh no. Oh no is the place that can cause us to lose our focus. Oh no, those places that can cause us to get off course. Oh no is a place of disobedience. Oh no is a place of failure, a place that is designed to make us backslide. A matter of fact, the name itself tells us that we do not want to go there. I'm talking about such places of depression. Has anybody ever been to Oh No? I'm talking about a place called foreclosure or bankruptcy, but we can call it Oh No. This place, Oh No, is a place where there is no jobs. There is no love. Oh No is the place where we lose loved ones. So who wants to go back to a place like that? When we are asked to come to Oh No, there are three things we have to do to stay where God has elevated us. The Bible declares that after Nehemiah had re received the message asking him to come to Oh No, the Bible tells us that he sent the message back saying, Oh No, I'm not coming because I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it to come down to you? Nehemiah takes a stance to the enemy. So before I take my seat, I just want to share three things that you need to do to stay up and not come down. The first thing you have to do is be diligent. To be diligent means that it's why, it's why Nehemiah said I'm doing a great work. That means his work is current and his work is active. A lot of times when we are doing the Lord's work, we become slack and slothful. But why do we become slack and slothful when God does not, he's never slack or slowful with us? What is it about after God has blessed us and raised us to a higher place that we decide to put our hands down and stop working? Secondly, we have to be dedicated. Dedicated to the work God has assigned us to do. 
as we look at the text, Nehemiah not only says, I'm doing a great work, he goes on to say, and I cannot come down. In other words, he was saying, I'm committed to the, to the job that God has me doing. God is the one that has elevated me. I refuse to come down from the place in which God has elevated me. Don't be mad because you don't know the hell that I've been through to get where I am. See, people don't know about your sleepless nights. People don't know about what you've lost along the way to get where you are now. They don't know the valleys you traveled or the play, the pain, the journey that you've taken. They don't know the mountains you've climbed to get where you are now. All they know is God has you working in a high place. Instead of trying to get you down, they should be trying to get you to pull them up. And lastly, in order to stay up and not come down, you have to be defensive. To be defensive means that you are willing to protect the cause when others try to talk you down. Nehemiah asked them, why should the work stop while I leave and come down to you? I become defensive when people try to make me stop praising the Lord. Grove, I become defensive when people try to make me stop working for the Lord. I tell them that God has been too good to me. I say God has been too good for me to leave him hanging. God has been too good to us for us to walk off the job of ministry. The Bible declares in verse 4 that Nehemiah's adversaries asked him four more times to come down to oh no. But he responded in the same manner by saying, I am doing a great work and I cannot come down. So as I close, I know there have been some people that have been trying to talk you down from your post. I know they're trying to bring you down from the place in which God has elevated you. I'm sorry, but I'm starting to see a lot of us right here in the text. The enemy has been trying to push us down. Dr. Mariner, I've been watching you for the last 15 years. The enemy has been trying to pull you down. The enemy has been trying to knock you down. The enemy has been trying to blow you down, lie you down, and defame you down. It's been 32 years of preaching and ministry. I see that you are still up, so my words to you today is stay up and whatever you do, don't come down. I say this because if you did not stay up, many of us that you pulled up would still be down. Dr. Mariner, it's been 32 years, but please stay up and whatever you do, don't come down. Stay up when you feel like being down. Stay up and continue to pull us up. Stay up, Pastor Mariner. Stay up through the storms. Stay up until somebody gets saved. Dr. Mariner, stay up when life is carrying you through some struggles. Stay up until somebody gets delivered. Your haters become your graduators during the times of good and bad. All I'm trying to tell you, Pastor, is stay up until the devil is terrified. God is glorified and edified. Pastor Mariner, stay up until God calls you home. Dr. Mariner, stay up and whatever you do, don't come down. I know it's been 32 long years of ministry. You have stayed up for over 30 years. But there was another man that stayed up in ministry for over 30 years. Somebody say his ministry was only three and a half. But I beg to differ because his birth was a ministry. They also tried to take him down. The Sadducees tried to take him down. The Pharisees tried to take him down. Pontius Pilate tried to take him down. They thought the cross was the thing that would keep him down. But they didn't realize when they put that man on that cross, they were really pushing him higher up. Oh, the Bible says, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. But just in case you're confused, the man I'm speaking about is my Jesus. 
Is there anybody here that knows the man by the name of Jesus? I'm talking about the one that woke you up this morning and started you on your way. The one that has been walking with you through this thing called life. Is there anybody that knows my Jesus? Oh, they beat my Jesus, but I'm so glad he stayed up. They whipped my Jesus, but I'm so glad he stayed up. They mocked my Jesus, but I'm so glad he stayed up. They stabbed my Jesus, but somehow, some way, he stayed up and would not come down. What is it about this man named Jesus that he would stay up through all that pain? I've been doing some reading and the reason that he would not come down is because our lives needed to be saved. They went on to kill this man named Jesus. They didn't understand what they were doing. They thought that they had brought him down. So he stayed in the grave as the old preacher was saying all night Friday. He stayed in that same grave all day Saturday. And he stayed in there all night Saturday. But early Sunday morning, I said early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hand. He got up because he had you and I on his mind. He got up because his work was not finished. And he got up because he had to get up to stay up because he was not coming down. So as you look at your lives, as you look at the lives of our pastor, know that Jesus got up to stay up and he's not coming down. If you believe that, give God some praise. I said give God some praise. He's up and well. He's staying up and he cannot come down. I say that because he's at the right hand of the Father. Oh, can't you see him? He's at the right hand of the Father. The Bible never says that he's coming down. It says that he's coming back. Everyone all over the room, stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Give God some praise for your life. I'm sorry. All I do is preach Jesus. I preach Jesus because he's the one that saved my life. 